Hi, I'm Rob Isaacs. I'm at Duke University, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the dangers associated with fluoroscopic radiation, primarily focused on spine surgery. Ionizing radiation that comes from an x-ray machine, especially when it's taken interoperatively during a medical procedure, is an issue. It is an issue to you, to your patients, and the amount of information out there, the amount of literature out there that helps to define that is actually quite substantial. It impacts really everyone in the OR. You can see, obviously, report after report, series after series, and papers that look at the incidence of cancer among various people in the operating room, from orthopedic surgeons to C-arm techs. It's an occupational hazard, and it's not just cancer. It impacts lots of organ systems, and ultimately it's cancer, it's skin problems, cataracts are a big problem in the operating room because of the amount of radiation you're exposed to. There's actually two types of risks associated with radiation exposure. One is called a deterministic risk, and the other is called a stochastic risk. A deterministic risk means you will get it. It's predetermined you will get it at some point. A stochastic risk means there's a chance you'll get it. The example there is cancer. As you increase the amount of radiation you're exposed to, you increase the chances you're gonna get cancer. Just like the more you smoke, the more you're increasing the risk of getting cancer, lung cancer from smoking. The difference is a deterministic risk means you'll get it. In this case, cataracts. They say that you'll get a cataract as soon as you're exposed to more than 500 milligray of radiation. And that number keeps changing and keeps decreasing. Ultimately, what's been found is that as you're exposed to more and more radiation, like you're exposed to the sun when you're outside on a sunny day, ultimately you'll get a sunburn if you're out long enough. It's a deterministic risk. You will get it, like a cataract in this case. In fact, half the people in interventional suites, that's nurses, doctors, et cetera, have evidence for pre-cataract formation from the radiation exposure they get every day. Specifically though, we need to look at spine surgery. And in spine surgery, we need to think about both ourselves, but also our patients. This is an interesting paper that came out in Spine Journal, and it shows that treating a person, typically a, a younger female, for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, AIS, increases their risk of cancer somewhere between one and a half and two and a half percent. Basically, it's a 2% increased risk of cancer in that person from the amount of radiation they're exposed to for the treatment of their disease. 80% of that, three quarters, is coming while they're in the OR. So we need to be cognizant of what we're doing to our patients because this is a real number. And when we look at a minimally invasive case, which we all kind of assume is gonna be a lot higher, it's not surprising that it is. And if we look at a single level TLIP paper written by Bendel, where they looked at the amount of radiation people are exposed to, patient gets an average of 138 milligray which means kind of nothing to you probably as a random number thrown out, but actually there's a way to determine what that means. 138 milligray, if you look at the charts that are released by the government, there is a direct correlation to an increased risk of lifetime induced cancer from that radiation. It's gonna be different if you're male versus female. It'll be different based on your age. The younger you are, the more radiation sensitive you are, the more female you are the more radiation sensitive you are. But ultimately, if you just take a 30-year-old female and you look at the increased numbers of stomach cancers, colon cancers, et cetera, you add them up, about 1,000 increased cancers per 100,000 people, or about a 1% increased risk of lifetime cancer from 100 single dose, 100 milligray of radiation. If you look at 138 milligray of radiation, you're closer to 1.5% increased risk of cancer from that single level TLIF. And we need to be worrying about ourselves too, because not only is our patients being exposed to radiation, we are as well. And we're exposed to scatter radiation. And it's certainly worse on the side that you would typically want to stand on, the smaller side, the side of the x-ray source, where the radiation bounces off the patient and scatters and hits you. At least on the opposite side, on the II side, it's absorbed some by the body and scattered some before it hits you. And there's a lot less radiation on that side, but obviously it's a lot harder to stand on. The scatter radiation, the radiation we're exposed to in the OR, is the reason why there's a substantial increased risk of cancer among orthopedic surgeons. In this study, they said five times higher than their other physicians. 
And if you look, unfortunately, at spine surgeons who are exposed, not only because they're exposed to a lot of radiation, but they're a lot less extremity work and more central core work, which is larger areas of the body. Because of that, there's 10 to 12 fold more radiation in spine surgeons than in the average orthopedic surgeon. And certainly we need to be thinking about how we protect ourselves from this problem. And one way we all know is stepping away and taking less shots, et cetera, and wearing lead. So how effective is lead is a decent question. And where does that put us? So Schuffelberger, who uh, does open fluoroscopically assisted pedicle screws, looked at how much radiation he was exposed to during an average run of time. In this case, it was a, about a quarter of a year. And he figured out that when he puts in pedicle screws, he ends up getting a certain amount of radiation. In this case, 13.5 uh, millisieverts of whole body total occupational induced radiation exposure per year based on the way he puts in screws, which again, in a vacuum probably means very little. But when you look at that and you say, okay, you begin your career in orthopedic surgery at age roughly 30, and if you extrapolate that based on the cumulative impact per year over your lifetime, that within your first 10 years of your career, you'll exceed your lifetime limit of occupationally induced radiation. By the time you're done with your residency and a year or two after fellowship, you've exceeded your lifetime limit for occupational exposure. The reality is, is how many of us know that? How many of us are wearing dosimeters? How many of us are on an average case actually being monitored? Because we're not radiation workers, and so we're not required to wear them. And many hospitals don't require that. And so Kerry Eidler put out this uh, interesting paper where he basically said, well, it's easy to tell what a patient's getting exposed to. It's on the C-arm in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. You can actually see the amount of radiation that that patient's exposed to. He wore uh, one of these dosimeters, one of these electronic ones where you can actually see on a per case basis, not on a monthly or quarterly basis, but on a per case basis, how much radiation he got on that same case. He did 60 or so of the same procedure over a year, consecutive cases, and what he found was that effectively is linear. When your patient's getting more radiation, you get more radiation. When a person's heavier or they're harder to image, you're getting more radiation. And it actually accounts for two-thirds of the variance of that single item, meaning that two-thirds you can predict with fairly high accuracy what you're gonna get exposed to without wearing one of those dosimeters just by using that formula. You're getting exposed on a day-to-day -day basis and you need to think about it. And yes, you should be wearing lead because lead's very effective, but how effective really is it? So if you go back to the Shuffleberger data, he actually looked at that exact question. In the middle of this paper, he actually showed that he had a dosimeter on the outside of his thyroid shield and one on the inside of his thyroid shield. So he's basically looking at the effectiveness of his thyroid shield. And it turns out it does a decent job. It blocks two thirds of the radiation, 66%. But another way to think about that is it's letting a full third of the radiation straight through the thyroid shield. Now, certainly lead can be more effective than that. New lead, very clean lead can be much more effective than that. But the reality is in this case, in this study, that's how effective it is. It lets some substantial amount of radiation through. And here's a scary paper. If we go back to the Bendel paper, the minimally invasive T-lift paper, what you see is that when he looked at the amount of radiation that got through his lead at the level of his groin. And just as a matter of something to reference off of, he said, how much radiation goes unprotected at the level of my thyroid? So a dosimeter outside his thyroid shield versus one underneath his lead at the level of his groin. And it turns out 84% of the radiation that hit the thyroid shield on the outside of the thyroid shield went through the lead and hit his groin. Now, some of that's because it's a lot closer to the source. And so there's a lot more radiation down at the level of your groin than there is at the level of your thyroid. But that's a particularly scary number if you think about it, that how little effect we're getting off of lead and how much we need to think about other techniques. Because it's not just surgeons or others that are interested in this problem and worried about this problem. The FDA is worried about this problem. In 2010, it came out with its white paper specifically identifying fluoroscopy as one of the major problems for radiation exposure. Interoperative fluoroscopy is a major problem, so the FDA believes, as does the Joint Commission. 
they issued a Sentinel event specifically on the radiation impact, the radiation risks associated with diagnostic imaging around the same time. This is something that all of the major groups in medicine believe is an issue, and we need to be cognizant, both for ourselves, as well as our coworkers, as well as our patients. Thankfully, there is a solution, and it's a universally accepted solution, and it's called ALERA, as low as reasonably achievable. The idea here is basically it's two. If you can avoid taking an x-ray, do. If there's a way around it, use it. And then the second is if you end up taking an x-ray, take an x-ray as low of radiation as possible, as low as reasonably achievable. And it's easy to turn down the radiation off of a C-arm. So right next to where your C-arm tech uh, has their hand and is pushing the yellow button to take an image, there's a couple buttons on every C-arm, one called pulse, one called low dose, and another one called auto. Those little buttons in the uh, lower right-hand corner will directly lower the radiation without a lot of work. Push of a button can have dramatic impact. In fact, if you look at GE's literature on this, you can lower radiation 95% by simply pressing those buttons and doing nothing else. It's simple to lower radiation. It's what we should be doing, and it has dramatic impact. If you lower the radiation down to one pulse and you push pulse and low dose, two buttons, and you take some live fluoroscopy, what you'll find is that it's as effective as brand new lead. In this case, you can see above and below lead with a dosimeter, just like Eidler did in his paper, versus the in front of the lead using one pulse low dose, the combination of those two buttons. And you can see that a dramatic and statistically equivalent amount of radiation is being admitted. The amazing thing there is it's not just impacting the patient, it's impacting everyone in the room. Lead helps you. One pulse low dose helps everyone. So using pulse and low dose is something you should strongly consider. And in fact, if you look at the American College of Radiology, Pediatric Radiology, basically every major medical group in the country, and for that matter in the world, have signed on to various pledges. In this case, the Image Gently campaign, which is in many hospitals. You'll see these signs, pause and pulse. Pause, don't take an x-ray if you don't need to. Pulse, use pulse fluoroscopy. Push those buttons on the side of the machine. Lower the radiation per image. Expose our patients and ourselves less radiation. And I said it was universally accepted, and that's definitely true, but the problem is, and the reason why it's hard to use in the OR, is because it has an impact. It lowers the image quality when you do that. And when you look at a standard dose image, this is what it looks like, and that is uh, an acceptable image for what I need to do for that patient. If I hit one pulse and low dose, I now, unfortunately, now have washed out that image. It's grainy, it's washed out, it's light, I can't really see the anatomy. I know it's there. I can get the blur of it through the snow, through the static. But ultimately, at some point, as we lower the radiation, we're also lowering the image quality associated with that radiation dose, and we're lowering our ability to do the surgery successfully or correctly. And so if we look at the, where the American College of Radiology is saying that practice guidelines are teaching us how to do these types of procedures, what they're telling us is, yes, Everyone in the room is responsible for ALERA. That means your radiology tech and you as supervising physician all have a responsibility to lower the radiation to ALERA dosing as possible, as low as reasonably achievable. Having said that, they're also extremely clear on this point that beyond the fact that you have a responsibility to do that, you can't do that beyond diagnostic image quality needed to achieve your objective of surgery needing to do the right thing. Ultimately, we still need to get high quality imaging to do a surgery correctly. And in fact, people are using pulse low dose fluoroscopy in the operating room successfully. Here's a paper by uh, Toomey Allen where they're showing that they can do a minimally invasive T-lift using a low dose protocol, which is pulse and low dose and lowering the amount of radiation. And here's a picture from his paper showing that grainy washed out image and what he feels is a very safe way to do the procedure. But he puts caveats in his paper and he says that when you lower the radiation, you're losing things like the detail of the pedicle. And when you need 
finer detail, you need to turn up the radiation. You don't limit your ability to do the procedure correctly. Ultimately, that leads to an idea that was the impetus for what we call less ray. Less ray is a technology. It's there to help to improve the image quality off of low radiation images, and in the process, can take those low radiation image, like the one in the middle, and by using, like Adobe Photoshop, image techniques, it can improve the image quality of that image from the shot in the middle to look like, at the same time on the lesser machine, the shot at the far right. Ultimately, it adds the clarity to the image you need so that you can use these lower radiation imaging settings and feel comfortable that you're seeing the anatomy appropriately. And it's been used successfully in the operating room. This is a internally randomized control trial. Every single person was used both for the control and the experimental side of the study. Every patient had half of their procedure done using low radiation imaging settings and less ray enhancement, and at the same time, the other half of their procedure done using standard radiation imaging and no image enhancement. And what they found was effectively 75% or so radiation reduction, both to everyone in the room, including the patient, as well as during every part of the procedure. You can successfully use these low radiation settings and perform the procedure properly when supplementing with image enhancement, with the ability to enhance the low radiation image, make it much more user-friendly and uh, safe. Less ray have other benefits as well. It has a number of additional features, such as image stitching, where it allows you to make a composite image um, of the spine in this case, or other anatomy, in order to see much larger areas of the body than you can on a single shot of the C-arm. You can track the C-arm, which allows you to get back to the right place without hacking a bunch of hunt and shoot x-rays to try to figure out where you wanna be. It allows you to center the C-arm like a viewfinder on exactly the right anatomy, again, to help lower radiation and to get the right shot at the right time. Angle finder is a way of actually getting it lined up properly. If you take an odd angle, an oblique angle, a Ferguson angle to the anatomy, you can find that shot and you can find it again and again by following the screen prompts and not taking x-rays over and over to find that shot. And then alternate is a way that you can effectively remove metal objects that have been added to the field or dye or those types of things and see the anatomy and go back and forth to see what's new and what's old to effectively see the change over time. Here's an example of serum tracking as the fluorotech moves the fluoroscopy machine in towards the body. You can get an idea because of what's on the screen. You can actually see the anatomy underneath the x-ray machine before you take the shot. In this case, it's yellow, don't take an image. But now you see the anatomy coming into view. Now it's centered properly. And ultimately that'll lead to when you push the button, it'll be in the right spot. Sometimes the angle's off. Sometimes you want a slightly angled image or the anatomy slightly angled. By adjusting these angles and making them green, now the whole circle turns green and the image is lined up properly. It uses effectively optical image guidance to do this. Um, which is all on the C-arm itself to allow it to track it back into the right position. As I alluded to earlier, you can use a feature called Angle Finder, which effectively allows you to adjust the angle in the orthogonal plane. For example, in AP, you can line up the disk space so it's nice and flat to one of these vertical lines by adjusting the height of the bed, the angle of the bed, the rotation of the bed, those types of things. Once you've done that, when you switch to the opposite image, the lateral in this case, you have a perfectly flat end plate view. All that without ever taking x-rays to try to find what that shot is. It goes right away. And lastly, the feature of alternate, where effectively by pushing a button on the screen, you can allow the metal objects to disappear and reappear and disappear again. And so you can see the blocked anatomy. You can see the canal in this case and know exactly where the canal is relative to the retractor and know where is safe and where is dangerous. It gives you another piece of information to make surgery safer and ultimately help our patients out in the long run. The other nice feature is you can use alternate to also see the amount of correction that's achieved in this case with inner body fusion, the amount of angle and disc height change 
by simply between the initial shot taken and the current shot. And this is in real time during surgery. You can actively see how you've changed the anatomy. Image stitching is just building a composite image like you have panorama view on your cell phone. By simply pushing a button, you can activate this mode, which allows you to build these stitched images, these composite images. One after the other, quickly you can form a three foot film, so you can get a much larger view of the spinal anatomy, for example. And finally, if you look at the results, is a nicely blended full spine x-ray in this case, a large view of the anatomy, much larger than you can give you off of a single shot of an x-ray of a fluoroscope. Much easier to get in the operating room, at least in my operating room, than plain films to do the same thing. In conclusion, can't stress enough the importance of being cognizant about the amount of radiation that we are all exposed to, both ourselves, our coworkers, and our patients, and using simple techniques such as the Alera techniques, using pulse and low dose, and simple technologies that can allow you to lower the amount of shots you take, and ultimately the radiation associated with those shots because it'll have impact on yourselves and your patients long-term. Thank you very much.